Hey guys, and welcome to the Money Talks News Podcast. This episode, we're talking about making your kids responsible adults. You know, you've already got a lot invested. According to the Brookings Institution, it costs $310,000 to raise a kid from birth to age 17. So at some point, we certainly hope that they're going to become financially independent and stop using the bank of mom and dad. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If you want to live your best financial life as an empty nester, well, then make sure your kids are ready to fly on their own. We're going to help you do that. I'm Stacy Johnson. As usual, my co-host will be financial journalist Miranda Marquette. Hello, Miranda. Hello, Stacy. Let's launch these Listening grown-ups. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Let's be grown-ups. Listening <laughs> in and sometimes contributing is our producer and novice investor, Aaron Freeman. Hello, Aaron. I'm not grown up yet. You are not grown up yet. <laughs> Cut that hair and get a job. Today, we have a very special guest. It is Bobby Rebell, financial journalist and author of the book, Launching Financial Grown-Ups. Bobby, thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys so much for having me. We are delighted because I want to learn how to be a grown-up. Before we start I, this podcast, guys, go ahead. What were you going to say, Bobby? Oh, I feel the same way a lot of the time. <laughs> yes, if I don't look in a mirror, I'm still 21 years old. Um, but when I do look in a mirror, well, I'm not even going to tell you what I feel. Um, okay, so what we're going to do, before we start a podcast today, folks, remember, if we give if we give something that sounds like financial advice, it really isn't. If we discuss specific investments, don't ever take our advice as, as w- without checking out yourself, doing your own research, being your own adult when it comes to money, in other words. Okay, so let, let's dive into this topic. And, and first of all, we're, we're going to talk about how to raise financially responsible kids from an early age, right? It didn't have to be kids that are 15 or 21. They could, do we start when they're five? You start at the earliest yes. opportunity that makes sense for you. Um, but I wrote the book, Full Disclosure, because I needed it for my older teens. I was struggling. Um, there's a ton of great books out there for kids under 16. And I just found there was nothing for me when it came to the older kids and money. Um, so that's how it started. But absolutely, you're right on it. I mean, as, as early as, as you see an opening to have conversations about money, go for it. Yeah, by the way, we I should have said this at the outset too. I have very little to say on this topic because I'm the only one of the four of us who have no children. So you guys all have one. Is that is that where we are? Aaron's got one. I've got, got one. Bobby. And what are the ages? 26. 19 well he'll be 20 in a month so almost 20 you guys are in the zone and what about you bobby so i have three children i have a 26 year old stepdaughter who is the star of the book and wrote the epilogue which is everyone's favorite part of the book with her money tips she inspired the book um, in a very positive way it was i was a little nervous whether she would meet the goal because the the book kind of uh, centers around her goal of, of owning her own apartment. And spoiler alert, she does successfully buy her own apartment by the time the book is published. We didn't know that when I got the book deal. Could have gone anyway. Um, I have a 23-year-old. He just turned 23, um, who is a boomerang kid. He just moved home after college. And we could talk about how I'm in the thick of of helping him be a financial grown-up. And then I have a 15-year-old who is in ninth grade. Wow. That's lots of kids. Yeah, that's more that's kids awesome. than I thought you had. <laughs> it's a Yay. lot of kids. I know. And I was an Insta mom. For for those of you who um, have sort of, you know, felt like you, you can't catch up if you have a kids later in life than you thought. I was single at 35 and I basically by 37 had three kids. So there you go. Insta mom. Yep. Two, two, two bonus babies that came to live with us right away, which is amazing. It's been wonderful. And then we had a baby and we had three kids pretty quickly. Um, so I got a very quick... It was a steep learning curve on parenthood um, in the best way. Do you guys feel like you have a handle on this? I mean, you know, do, do you feel like it was easy raising responsible kids when it comes to money? Or do you think it was hard? Or are you still doing it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, so one of the things about being a parent, I think, is that it's, it's something that you are always and and – Teaching is, is kind of rough, right? It is kind of rough because you want them to make good decisions, but you're watching them make mistakes, but you also want them to learn from their mistakes. And so you kind of have to do this push and pull in, in terms of like, okay, how much how much do I get involved? How much do I guide and, and everything else? And it is, it's always just this kind of weird balancing act. You know, my son, my son recently moved to his own place 
uh, for the first time. He's not living in my basement. And he, and, and, but part of the thing is, is I was just like, well, I want him to succeed. He's got a part-time job. He's going to mm-hmm. school. So I'm, I told him I'd pay half his rent. He could find a place, but I would pay half his rent up to a certain amount, right? I'm not, it's not, it's not a blank check here. And so I think, you know, finding that balance where it's like, okay, what is reasonable and helpful mm-hmm. Well, at the same time, not doing everything for them. And Miranda, have you set up timelines? Is there um, an exit strategy to be off that subsidy at some point? Yeah. So, yeah. So we've talked about like, okay, so this is a reasonable amount of time for you to finish school. So once we hit that reasonable amount of time to finish school and and work on finding a job, then yes, we're going to wean you off of the subsidy. So yeah, we do have, we do have a, a timeline. And I think the key too is, is we keep talking about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, wait, I think what do you mean you keep talking oh, ahead, about it? Oh no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to, I was asking Miranda, what, what do you mean talk? you keep talking about it in what context? Yeah. So I think, and Bobby can probably talk about this as well, but one of the things is, is a lot of people are like, okay, well, let's have a money talk with our kids when they're in seventh grade and now we're done. They should be successful now. And the reality of the situation is that you have to keep having these conversations, but we have a hard time in our society talking about money, including with our kids. And, and Bobby can probably talk about this a little bit more. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, Bobby, but you know, how do we get over that fear, that taboo we have in our society of talking to our kids about money. And that's, I think, where we start. Why do we have this taboo and how do we get over it? Is that still here or is that from a previous generation? Because my parents, it was very taboo to talk about money. And I think my parents weren't very literate about money either. I mean, my father didn't start talking about stocks until he was my age, I think. And that was only for his own edification. It was not to talk about the with the family about it. I'm a little lost you know. by this whole thing, guys, because my parents talk to me about money all the time. For example, um, when I was five years old, my father presented me with a check or presented me with a bill for my delivery. And he said I had to pay him back. So I had to start working in the fields when I was five just to pay for my delivery. No, but but seriously though, my parents did say they were they talked about money and in, in the sense that we don't have any. You know, you know, we have to my, my mother when it was two for one. Or you can only buy a limited number of things at the grocery store. When I was eight years old, my mother put me behind her in line so she she get this extra can of corn or whatever, you know. So they talked a lot about not wasting money. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and you guys are talking about uh, you're hesitant to talk about money. What do you mean by that? I don't understand. What are you hesitant to talk about? I think in my research, one thing that has come up over and over again is a very common reason for parents not talking to their children about money is because they feel they're not qualified to talk about it or they feel that they are bad with money so they avoid the topic um, or they simply don't have enough money and they don't want their their children to worry. So it's interesting. In some ways, depending on how it's presented, it's healthier for parents to talk honestly with their children and age appropriate and personality of child and maturity of child appropriate also because it's just not an arbitrary age. Um, it is good to have conversations is about money, whatever they may be. It may be, I would love to subsidize you, but here's what I can do while still keeping my goals on track. Because if I don't have my retirement money set up, you're going to be in a position where I'm going to be asking you for money and I don't want that. So, you know, to Miranda's point, be having conversations. And I think, I don't know, we're not going to get into Miranda's personal finances, but, you know, she should be talking realistically about both of their futures and how they're setting themselves both up for success. We should get in. I think we should get into Miranda's personal finances. <laughs> They're fine, <laughs> Come on. Stacey. They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted, I want I want deets, baby. I want to know exactly what's going on. I, in I can help my son pay his rent. <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> but but Aaron, but Aaron's parents didn't talk to him about money. And w- during the introduction, you what did you refer to Aaron as? Your amateur investor? What did you call him? Beginner investor? Yeah, a novice investor, yes. Novice investor. Well, now, yeah, and I mean, Aaron, how, how old are you that you're calling yourself a novice investor, just to be clear? Well, I'm 48, right. but you see, no, my parents never discussed money, but because they were private, right. they were very private okay. people. They didn't want anybody to know about it, and, and that included family. And that was, you know, that, that came from the previous generation. Their their parents kind of, you know, taught them that. Uh, so it wasn't until I started working with Stacy that I started opening my eyes up to personal finance. And then by the time I started talking to my kid about it, he was already a cynic of the finance system, and he was like, ah, "This is all a bunch of made up crap, and I don't want to play." And then he didn't believe in the stock market or anything, so you could never get through to him. Right. So, and of course, we, now he's still living with his mom. Go ahead, there go you ahead, go. Bobby. Yeah. 
And I think, and I think part of it too is, it, yes, there's that privacy, and you know what Bobby was talking about too is this reluctance. I think to be embarrassed of of mm-hmm. your money, right? And and no, I don't never understand that. Explain that s- embarrassed of your money. So so like when I was. Oh gosh, you know, when my, when my ex and I had a bunch of credit card debt and everything else, and my son was, I mean, my son was probably seven or eight at this time. And it's like, it was, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to admit that like, okay, I, I messed up, you know, <laughs> I made all oh, these okay. mistakes. No, and mean. a lot of parents don't like to show their mistakes. And I think what we're seeing right now in this generational shift that maybe Aaron is referring to is, and it's not just about money is, as parents, like I am way more open with my son and we have a way more, um, relationship. Like my son comes to talk to me about things that I would never, ever have considered going to talk to my parents about because they never cultivated that kind of open relationship. And it's probably very similar to Aaron's, uh, relationship with his parents as well. Like, but my son comes to me about things like, Hey mom, can you help me learn X? Hey mom, can you tell me how your birth control works? Hey mom, can you tell me about some money things? Like just all of this stuff like that he has come to me with over the years. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and after I had, after I had, um, after I had my tubes tied, he wanted to talk through about like, okay, how does that work? What are the mechanics of it? It was nothing like weird and whatever, but like, I would never have, you know, when my, when my mom had her hysterectomy while I was in college, I would never have asked even my mom about her hysterectomy. I, I'm really <laughs> glad you're bringing this stuff up, Miranda, because these are questions I had too. Like, I went, right. I mean, now we're, we're getting into exactly TMI. What exactly is the mechanics of having your tubes tied? But the reality okay? is, 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 right. It goes back to like, how open are you? And a lot of Mm-hmm. Our parents' generation were embarrassed of their money mistakes. They didn't want to talk about their money mistakes. I talked to my son. Here are the things I did wrong. Here are the things I wish I'd done different. Yeah. And here's. But now it's easy when he's an adult. But you know, okay. Here's what I'm. Here's what I want to ask you guys. Okay, I'm 12. Okay. Now I understand. Actually, now my parents never told me how much money they had until you know until near the end. You know, I mean, I think the reason that makes sense because you don't want to do that because in case they have some money. You don't want your kids to think it's theirs mm-hmm. to take, you know, so you, so you don't talk about the money you have. But, what, okay, you've got a 12-year-old, and, and they come to you and they say, I want a go-kart. And you don't have enough money for a go-kart. Or maybe you have a whole bunch of money. So, Bobby, mm-hmm. how, do, how do you deal with that? What do, what do you well, say? Well, it's not necessarily about the go-kart, about the money aspect of the go-kart. I would start with... Do, does your does this something that your ch- you want your child to have? I mean, we have this discussion all the time. My child who is um, away at school would like me to send him an Xbox, and it's irrelevant what the Xbox costs. We are not sending that child an Xbox, right? <laughs> so first of all, do you want your child to have the go kart? Then you can get into okay, what does it cost? And what you really have is an opportunity to talk them talk to them about where their priorities are with respect to money. So let's say it's a twelve year old. Let's say you have allowance. You can map out okay. Well, this is your allowance per week. In order to get your allowance, you have to do X, Y, and Z, right? Let's map out how long that's going to take. Let's map out maybe for the holidays, you can ask your relatives that will be giving you gifts anyway to channel that towards a gift card or towards a fund that you set up. Maybe this is an opportunity to set up a savings account, even if it's the child is young, just, you know, a piggy bank or a jar with coins in it, whatever it may be, some form of savings. So I would really view it as a way to teach a child about long-term savings. And maybe you incentivize them. Maybe you say, if you save this much by this time and you give X percentage to charity, I will match this dollar amount. So mm-hmm. I would use it as a starting point and an opportunity to have discussions about money and, and use it as a lesson, assuming you want them to have the go-kart, which is a big question. <laughs> okay. okay. So th- that makes total sense. So you're turning everything basically into a lesson. Let me ask this question. What if you're really rich? I mean, what if it's obvious that you've got lots yeah. of money? D- is, so that I seems love- like that would be oh, more difficult than, than not having, you know, than barely making ends meet. Because a kid can look around and see that you're middle class. But what if, you're, what if you have lots of money? Then what? You totally nailed it. And a lot of my book is really for parents that are want to teach their children about money when they do have money. It's not a book, you know, if you are teaching your, if you have a true lack of money and I don't, I I want to sort of, I don't, I don't want to criticize Miranda. I don't like using the money mistakes because very often people don't have money because they're just working really hard and they don't have enough money, especially in this environment with inflation. Sometimes we don't have money because we don't have money because of systemic issues, which I do go into in the book a little bit. There are 
factors in our society that work against people. And sometimes people are capable of earning more money and some people can earn less money. It's the way capitalism works and that's where we are. So I just want to take that sort of shame out of it that not every situation is mistakes, though plenty of us, and I'm looking in the mirror, make many mistakes. But the book, Launching Financial Grownups, really does focus on parents that have the choice to subsidize their children and have the choice to to buy these things or find a way through, you know, like I talked about the child earning some money and so on, to, to do that, which is a luxury. But it's also very dangerous because it is harder to say no when it's not no, you have to save for that or no, we don't have the money for that. If it's no, just because yeah, I just don't think you should have that. It's a lot more complicated, but that's also where the hard work is and where the heart of my book is really about helicopter parents that often as our children get into the teenage years and the young adult years, we run the danger of becoming what I refer to as concierge parents, where because systemic things have changed in our society, like things as simple as text messaging where we can our children can reach us at any time and ask us for something at any time they also can look up what our home is worth they know mm-hmm. exactly what we probably paid for our car and so on so there's a lot of information out there already about us and it's on us to make sure that we frame it correctly and make sure our children understand what that money is for, how we want them to approach money, how we want them to use money to live their life in the best way for them, and really coming back to the values that we want to instill them with as parents, because it's not always about a scarcity of money. Sometimes it's about being deliberate and responsible with our money and creating a culture of generational wealth. Well, I'll tell you what, Bobby, I really want to know the answer to this question, and that (laughs) is, what do you do when a kid fails to launch. And and when we come yeah. back, we're going to take a really quick break. When we come back, I want you to tell me exactly what to do with this kid who won't stop leeching off of me, and now he's 50 years old. Okay, now maybe he's 25. Uh, wait, are you talking about whatever. Aaron? Okay, are you talking about gonna... Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. no Aaron, Aaron has specific tasks. He, <laughs> he gets an allowance, and he accomplishes his, his goals, and everything's fine. <laughs> um, oh, okay, so hold on, guys. We are halfway through our show. It is time to pay the bills. Be right back. <laughs> Okay, we are back. Before we start again, though, if you appreciate what we do on this podcast and do something for us, share this show with your friends and family on your favorite social media platforms and subscribe. It takes you two seconds, really helps us. And now we're done with the commercial after the commercial. Okay, so back to where we were talking before, Bobby. Okay, I've got a kid. Let's let's say he's 25. He went to college, he came back, um, and now he doesn't seem to want to leave because his his laundry is getting done and his meals are getting paid for and... He's using the car and blah, blah, blah. So what do we do to get this kid out of the damn house? What are you doing? I think that's the question. I think you look at, first of all, go back and review what you did to get yourself in this situation. Because very often parents are pointing to the children and they're not thinking carefully, wait, what am I actually doing? What messages am I sending and what actions am I taking that have created and are perpetuating this situation? So think about what you've what you can control based on what you've set up, right? So Miranda, she is setting up, yes, she is subsidizing her. So she decided, how do I get my kid to leave? And we don't know the specifics if he wanted to or not, but she's saying, okay, if you are will, if you can and are willing to pay for half your expenses, I can subsidize half of your rent for this time period and always have an exit strategy. So if you have a child that has income that's reliable, you can simply do something like that or just discuss it. In my case, and I talk about this a lot in the book, we had a college graduate in my oldest uh, oldest child who came home and she said very specifically, I wanna buy an apartment, I have this much money saved, this is how much I earn, I'm gonna put all of it, you know, literally 98% of it, all of it, here's a spreadsheet of when I will have my down payment, You have access to seeing my bank account. I could see her account at the bank. It was in my general field with my account, so I could watch the money adding up. So it was totally open, totally open communication. She had a timeline of when she was going to be able to start looking for an apartment, and she even understood. We went over how much the common charges would be, how the taxes worked, what the closing costs would be. So we had this dialogue, and we put her on a path. And yeah, she was home for a little over two years, but with a plan, right? If you have a kid with no plan, you need to sit down and say, what's the plan and how can I help you get there in terms of the resources that you have? And if you don't have the resources to subsidize them, then don't, right? It's on them. But there's so many variables of what they can do 
with your strong suggestions. Maybe they move out with roommates. Maybe they have to temporarily, while they're home, have a hodgepodge of jobs. Right now, my amazing 23-year-old just got out of out of um, film and TV school. He is working almost every day. Is it a full-time job, one job? No, he, but he is putting together lots of freelance jobs that will, I believe in him, and I believe he'll eventually have an amazing job. And so we have him here, but we are literally, before I came on with you guys, I was touching base with him because he just got done with a great job where he made amazing connections and he's helping. He's good. He'll walk the dog and do the things and be a contributing member of the household. And we had, um, for example, we had a bill come in that was for him. It was a very nominal amount, but I said, I will pay this bill, but I want you to call the company and verify it because there was something fishy about it. I said, when you you verify that it's correct, and then for now, we're going to pay this bill, but in the future, he knows he will, but I'm teaching him that it's his bill, and he's making the phone call so that he understands what will happen when he takes over this bill. It was a healthcare-related bill. It seems to me at this point, Bobby. We're training him to learn to pay his own bills, even though right now we're choosing to let him bank the money so he has a big emergency fund when he leaves. Our home. It seems to me at this point that the best advice that I could provide for our listeners would be to take their children and send them to you <laughs> so that you can raise them. Because it sounds like your kids are self-launching. There's no failure to launch in your family. Well, so but I, I say I, everyone ship their 15-year-olds to Bobby. Well, I think we're are, are we confusing are we confusing failure to launch versus financial literacy? Okay, so mm-hmm. when I was 18, all I wanted to do is get away from my country bumping right. way of life on the farm. And I moved to the big city and I was on my own. But that didn't mean I was financially literate. I mean, I I did not know how to save. I spent money on credit cards. You know, I bought things that I shouldn't have bought. And right. and my parents didn't do that. I mean, my parents are very right. fiscal. You know, they, yeah. they always bought cars cash. They never used yeah. financing. I mean, they're they were very good with their money. They just never taught that to me. You know, they never right. said, here, this is why we're doing it. And this is, right. you know, how it benefits you. And they never did that. Right. It did, not mean, I, did not mean I didn't want to get out of the house. <laughs> you know, I was gone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, no, I think you're spot on. Fi- leaving the home is not the same as being financially literate. What I'm trying to do with this Launching Financial Grown-Ups book, and really it's a movement, and you can tell I'm very passionate about it, is not have what, what happened generations ago, which was you're this arbitrary age, you're 18, you're 22, bye-bye, you're cut off, figure it out, right? right. I... In the book, people are very surprised because that's what they expect. They expect me to tell parents, cut off your kid. But as you can tell, nothing is further from the truth. Um, if anything, we are embracing having our kids come back for this sort of training period <laughs> where we teach them so that when they go out, like I said, we are making sure if my my son is out there and he's earning money for now, we're not tra- we can we can afford to not charge him rent. Some parents may have a different situation. I want him banking that money. So when he goes out, he has an emergency fund. So when he goes out, he has financial stability. I may not make him pay, you know, token bills, little tiny bills of $10, $15 that come, but I'm making sure that he is aware that they exist so that when he does move out and he starts getting these co-pays from insurance companies and whatnot, he knows what to do, right? He knows to make sure they're legit, that they're valid, and then to pay them. So we're training him while he's here. We're not just doing everything. And and he's he's a great kid. He's contributing to the household by doing all the things that are just, you know, expected as being a member of a household, whether it's taking the trash out, walking the dog, making dinner sometimes, doing some grocery shopping. He's a member of the household. He's not being treated like a five-year-old. He's being treated like a 23-year-old who's home and really being productive and getting his career started. What if he wasn't productive? In other words, I, yeah. I want to address the the people out there because it sounds like you and Miranda um, have taken really good care. I mean, and raise your kids money smart. Uh, and they, and as a result, they become responsible. Right. I can't speak for, for Aaron's cause, uh, because I don't, I've, I've met Aaron's son before, but anyway, I don't, but he, he's been away from Aaron for a long time. But anyway, the point I was going to, the point I'm going to make is there are people, because I used to hang out with them who basically <laughs> don't get a job. They just sit yeah. there. Maybe yeah. they smoke a little weed. Maybe they play some video games and, you know, and they, and they go, I'm trying to get a job, mom. You know, but they're not, or they're yeah. lost. And so, and, and so, you you want to go? That? You want to go? Okay, you're out of here. You know, you got five days or five weeks or five months, whatever it is. You're out of here. But they know you're not going to throw them out in the street with no money. Mm-hmm. You're not going to do that. So how do you how do you in, in, instill some kind of um, confidence or ambition in this this kid who has none? 
Yeah. Well, first of all, I love the fact that you brought in the word confidence because I think that is essential to the conversation. Very often, parents don't realize it by, by allowing that to go on. They're basically telling the kid that they don't have the confidence in them, that they can do it. And that also is what you're telling your kid when you over-subsidize them, when you just give them the money. I mean, someone is giving this kid money to, to just sit around, right? Someone is filling the refrigerator. Someone is allowing this. So it's not a question of just arbitrarily throwing them out of their your home. Most parents are not realistically going to do that in our generation. Right. But right. it is a question of, you know, sitting the kid down, taking away the distractions, just saying, let's make a plan because you're too good for this. And let's go through it together. What do you want to be doing? And let's make a plan on how to get you there. And, and being the parent, very often we make the mistake, um, and I'm speaking to many Gen Xers like myself, of wanting to be friends with our kids because culturally we do have so much in common with them. And we also have, a, we are a generation that identify our success with our children's success. And we want them to be our friend and our peer as they get older. And we don't want them to fear us versus it sounds like Aaron's parents were sort of standoffish. They were sort of very much parental although not teaching about money, but they certainly weren't hanging out with you and asking the kinds of questions that Miranda's kids were asking, right? Right, right? So, I mean, my husband and I are on a group chat with our three children. And let me tell you, it gets a little raunchy sometimes. Inappropriate, I would say. I don't always like it. The 15-year-old's on there too. But that's the way that we relate as a generation now. Um, so things have changed a lot, but sometimes we have to be the parents, and maybe make some unpopular decisions and some unpopular requests of our children and take that ownership. And, you know, it's much like when, you, you know, you, you kind of want to be friends with your coworkers at work, but sometimes you get promoted to being the boss or you were always the boss and you forgot in the case of the parents. But you have to make the harsh decisions and, and be the tough one and give them that. It's a cliche, but give them the tough love um, and set the standards and, and make sure that they know that you have expectations for them. That it's it's they're better than that, and and I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think part of it does start, you know, before they're suddenly adults, right? I think. Oh yes, and and part of that is you know when we talk about and I did we, we kind of talked about this earlier. You know, I got a lot of crap from like members of my family and everything after my son turned eighteen, and I was like, okay, yeah, like we you know we, we got this big house, you can live in the basement, um, you know, you don't need to. I'm not going to charge your rent uh, because like. But it goes back to like, I got a lot of crap and people were like, oh, well, you should be charging him rent. He's 18, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, he's doing, he's got a plan. He's going to school. He's, yeah. you know, he's, he's doing some work and he has a plan. And so, you know, like if you look at, you know, how wealthy people help their kids, it's not by kicking them out of the house at 18 and being like, figure it out. But at the same time, we started laying the groundwork for these expectations when he mm -hmm. was when he was younger, when he was, you know, 10, 11, 12, we would be talking about money. OK, well, if you want this thing, if you want to buy this thing, first of all, let's talk about our values. Let's talk about mm -hmm. how are you going to value that? Do you want to do that? Do you want to buy this toy that you may not play with more than you want to maybe go to the movies and see this movie? And, you know, like, let's talk about our values and priorities and kind of bring it to that level. And as he got older, we talked more and more about, you know, hey, we kept having this conversation about let's talk about how we're going to handle schooling. You know, I do have a 529 set up for you, but I'm going to be honest, like there are different kinds of things that we have to talk about. How much money is going to be in there? How do you want to do mm -hmm. this? Well, yeah. you are going to be responsible for X, Y, Z. So maybe you need to look into scholarships to make sure you're helping pay that. I'll help you pay your living costs and everything else, but you need to be partially responsible for your tuition. So what does that look like? How do we get some scholarships? How do we compare costs? One of the things he ended up doing was let's go on a let's go on a campus visit down to Utah State. We went on this campus visit. They, you know, I let him look at, you know, here's how much it's going to cost. Here's what a presidential mm -hmm. scholarship does, all of this other stuff. So then he came back to me with a conversation and said, well, I'm also comparing the community college. He said, if I go mm -hmm. to the community college, can I live with you? And then you pay my tuition at the community college out of the 529. And but by having those conversations and showing him those things and, and talking through it on the regular basis, starting when he was young. That's how you start moving forward. You don't just show up at 18 and be like, okay, let's talk about, let's talk about the stuff now. You're an adult. Yeah. Go be an adult. Yeah. Like you have to kind of prep them for it. 
Well, it sounds like both you guys did that. And this is, it occurs to me uh, in listening to you both, uh, or all three of you really, that this is when you start early, it, the, these conversations you have, you know, when you start when a kid's 12 mm-hmm. and, and now the conversation you're having at the age of 23 is a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, and if you don't do that, it's going to be a lot harder. In other words, if you've done none of this and now your kid's 21, I mean, a friend of mine had a, um, a niece um, who was, she wouldn't do anything. They, they were going to pay for a college. She wouldn't even go visit. And then she ended up marrying some guy, you know, age of 19 and barely got out of high school, you know, the whole thing. And she, she ultimately became responsible, but it took a really long time. Yeah. So if you don't start these kids early and you have to catch up when they're 21 and they're, and they're already, you know, influenced in a way that they're just, I don't know what the word is, non-ambitious, mm-hmm. lazy. It's going to be hard for you to instill these, these um, qualities into them at that age, isn't it? I think you're bringing up a really important point. And first of all, I, you know, I have, like I said, three kids. You guys have one. But you can have siblings and have completely different. All the siblings have of your children, they all have different interest uh, levels in money. They have different abilities when it comes to money. And so that is something that you have to balance. And one thing that I do talk about in the book, which is something that I don't think gets enough attention, is the fact that sometimes... At certain life stages, your children are not going to be able to be financial grownups. And if something happens to you, it's really important to have set up guardrails. So that's where third parties can come in. And I'm not going to endorse any one organization, but we know there's many organizations out there um, that are very happy and that are well equipped to set up trusts and different um, guardrails that can be protectors where there's a third party that can be the bad guy um, and say, no, you can't do that. I know you love your new husband, but sorry, we're not releasing yeah. the family fortune to you or whatever it may be, or the small, tiny inheritance that they have that has to you know, be their backup, be their emergency fund, whatever it may be. So there is a place for third party advisors in this world. And I think that's important. And while I truly believe most Young people are very capable, more capable than we give them credit for. And in many cases, if you, as you've pointed out, Stacey, it's about setting expectations and letting them know that you have confidence in them. There are cases where people are going to make bad choices, especially at young ages. And this idea of, you know, there's a stereotype of like, the kid inherits all this money at age 21. No, 40, 50. Put the big ages out there. You can always go in and change it, right? But Definitely be protective and take a more cautious approach if you are truly worried that a young person is going to make bad choices that will have big consequences and you may not be there to protect them. I want to touch cool. on. You, you know, we're almost. I want to touch on one other thing. Um, we also live in a different time, but it's not different. I mean, we we used to live in a three generation household, and then we moved on to an industrial age where we had you know a one in- earner one earner household, and now we're kind of back in this era where it's we kind of need three generations in our household again to make ends meet. Um, how do you talk to people about that to make them feel like you know it's not a failure? You know, how can you talk to your family about how do we you know benefit from this and how do we thrive through this and all that kind of stuff? I don't think it's ever a failure. I think it's really wonderful. And it's something people may choose to do regardless of wealth. We hear about many, look, I'm going to joke about this, but the royals all live in the same place. You know, a lot of times, multiple (laughs) generations of families live together because that's a chosen lifestyle. We hear about sort of rich people on family compounds, and that's an exaggerated thing, but it doesn't really necessarily have to do with money. Now, in some cases, people are living together multiple generations because of money. And there's also a big upside to that. I think it's wonderful for children to grow up in closest with their grandparents. It can provide great, the really the best child care is a family member. So I would just always look at it as a positive spin. And if it comes to the point where, you know, they do want to separate households and it's financially viable, that's great too. I just think there's different configurations that work for different seasons of our life and we should always be positive about it. I, I, I moved home actually. Now I'm remembering I had a very brief marriage in my twenties and I moved home with my parents in no way was I in financial need for that. In fact, I made money on the residence that I sold because I had owned my first apartment and sold it. So I was in a very strong financial position, but I just wanted to be with my parents and it had nothing to do with money. I just needed to live with them for a little bit. Um, and that's also a great thing about having this open communication that Miranda talks about. I mean, yes, her son might be able to live financially. He can afford to live separate from her, but there may be a time in his life or in her life where something happens and they want to combine households again for completely non-financial reasons. What you want to do is have choices and really embrace the different seasons of your life. 
seasons of your life. I, I have to say, Bobby, that this is this is one of the big mysteries to me about this conversation is boomerang kits. I was counting the seconds to get out of my parents' house. I love my parents, but I always said my parents and Vegas are just alike. Three days <laughs> and I'm done. You know, I mean, I was there was no way I was going to go back to my. I would have lived in a car. And like I said, I love my parents, but I wanted to be an adult. You know, I wanted to be on my own. And my parents encouraged well, me. In fact, they said, we'll pay for your college as long as you go at least 1,500 miles away and only come home at Christmas. <laughs> they, they didn't really do that. But anyway, though, I, I, I don't understand this boomerang thing at all. I, I was happy I to know. get Our on my Our kids like own. us, Stacey. I don't know. The kids like us. Yeah, I, I guess so. I guess my parents <laughs> didn't like me. But anyway, now we do have to close. You guys, any, any last comments? One sentence. Someone out there that needs to know about this, one sentence from Miranda or, or from Bobby, how, what's the best way to, to raise a, a financially literate kid? One sentence. Lead with love and generosity. Awesome. Miranda? Uh, uh, have these conversations and start them early. Early and often. That's really good, too. Good advice. Okay, now we can start the music, Karen. I'm afraid we're out of time, folks, but we are never out of topic. Dig a little deeper. You're going to find links to lots more info in our show notes. And remember, if your goal is to make more, to spend less, to retire rich, your online home is moneytalksnews.com. And don't forget to check out Miranda's online home as well. That is Miranda Marquit, M-A-R-Q-U-I-T dot com. And of course, you want to see Bobby at her website. This is It's BobbyRebel dot com. I'm going to spell it for you. B-O-B-B-I R-E-B-E-L-L, BobbyRebel.com. And get her new book too. What's it called again, Bobby? Launching Financial Grownups. Live your richest life by helping your almost adult kids be everyday money smart. I'm going to read this book even though it's completely useless to me. <laughs> you got a question. That's not true. Don't you have young people in your life that you love, right? Yes, my wife is younger yes. than me and I love her. Yes. Okay, anyway, if you've got a question, comment, or topic you'd like to suggest, don't just sit there. Email us, hello at moneytalksnews.com. That's hello at moneytalksnews.com. And remember what I said before, if you like what we do, subscribe to our podcast. It takes you two seconds, really helps us, and, it, and our parents will be proud. So show us that you like us and subscribe. I'm Stacy Johnson. I'm Miranda Marquette. Mom and Dad, I'm coming back home. <laughs> and, and Bobby Riddell, or Rebel. Rebel. I keep saying that, Rebel. Oh, okay, I'll say that again. Yeah. And I'm Bobby Rebel. <laughs> there you go. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We're going to see you right here next time. <laughs>